Hi, so we've already had a conversation about the details of immediate inferences in categorical logic. We've discussed the uh, traditional and modern square of opposition, as well as other immediate inferences on both interpretations. Um, but I want to take some time now to uh, hone in on these inferences exclusively. In other words, our initial discussion was, uh, or involved rather, um, the basics, the mechanics of the categorical proposition. Um, and then we began to deploy those mechanics in talking about the logical structure of the propositions and what sorts of inferences you can make. But here, the assumption is that, for example, you already know what an O claim is or what an O proposition is, so that uh, we don't have to go through that material again. We can focus on how we understand the um, valid and undetermined inferences in both the traditional and modern interpretations. I will, however, uh, take a bit of time to discuss further what the distinction is between the traditional and modern interpretations of the universal propositions, that is the A and the E propositions, um, because typically that's a little bit trickier for us to get than the basic mechanics and some of the inferences. Okay, so what we're going to do is build first our traditional interpretation of the uh, inferences we make around the square of opposition. And when I say build, what I mean is this. You can see already that we have in the four corners of the left uh, pane or the left side of your screen the uh, A, E, and I, and O propositions. And what we're going to start with is the inferences uh, that we can make from A to I and E to O. In other words, we're going to talk about subalternation, and we'll talk about why it is the case that under certain circumstances, you can't infer the uh, A from the I or the E from the O and why under certain circumstances, and that will be the next slide, you can't infer the I from the A or the O from the E. But let's start with the A proposition and the uh, uh, T in parentheses is the assumption that the A proposition is true. Now look at the blue arrow associated with that truth value. And it allows us, you can see, to infer um, a true I. So if an A proposition is true, the I proposition is true. Why is that the case? Well, take a look on the right side of your screen, and you'll see the first bullet point says all SRP, and then there's a further uh, note, we assume there is a member of the S class. So if we're saying all SRP and there is an S, that means that it must be the case that some SRP. Now drop your eye to the third bullet point on the right side. What if we start with a true I proposition? Notice the two examples. When we start with a true I proposition, Sometimes the universal, that is the superaltern, is false, and sometimes it's true. So when we say it's true that some dogs are beagles, therefore all dogs are beagles, we've drawn an erroneous inference because the claim all dogs are beagles is false. And on the other hand, when we start with a different true, I claim some cats are animals, we can draw a true superaltern, that is a true universal affirmative, all cats are animals. So now draw your, your eye back over to the AI relationship. More specifically, look at the true I proposition, the second T in parentheses, and you'll see that the arrow going upwards leads to a question mark which is to say that if the I proposition is true, the A proposition is undetermined. 
Why is the A proposition undetermined? Well, we just saw two examples where, when starting from an I proposition that's true, we sometimes get a true A and we sometimes get a false A. In other words, we're dependent on looking at the content in order to understand the inference. And since, in logic, we want to avoid looking at the content to see if the inference is legitimate or not, we will say that we cannot infer the superaltern from the subaltern. Now, if you cast your eye over to the EO relationship, you'll see that it mirrors the AI, or another way to put it is the AI mirrors the EO. We can infer the subaltern from the universal proposition. The subaltern is the subaltern that corresponds to the universal. So a true E yields a true O, a true A yields a true I, but just as with the IA inference, the OE inference is undetermined. When the O is true, the E is undetermined, just like when the I is true, the A is undetermined. Go ahead and pause for a moment and read through the examples. You'll see that we have the same assumption for the E proposition as we do for the A. That is, we assume there is a member of the subject class. On this assumption, there must be at least one S member, which means that when the E is true, the O is true. When the A is true, the I is true. But it's not the case that when we start with a true I or a true O, we get a true, respectively, A or E. Now let's look at what happens when we have a false A or a false I, a false E, or a false O. Notice that when the A is false, the I is undetermined. When the E is false, the O is undetermined. Now take a look at the examples. So the first bullet point reads as follows. Suppose all SRP is false. On this assumption, the I proposition is undetermined. Look at the examples. All dogs are beagles, that's false. Some dogs are beagles, that's true. All rabbits are carnivores, that's false. Some rabbits are carnivores, that's false. When the inference is sometimes true, sometimes false, in other words, when the inference is not necessitated, it's undetermined. The same goes for the E to O proposition. That is, we cannot infer the subalternation for a false universal proposition. So suppose that no SRP is false. On this assumption, the O proposition is undetermined. The claim no dogs are pit bulls is false. The claim some dogs are not pit bulls is true. The claim no cats are animals is false. The claim some cats are animal are not animals is also false. Or is yeah, is also false. So you'll see in each of the immediate inferences here, the inference, respectively, some dogs are not pit bulls, some cats are not animals, uh, are true and false. Now cast your eye back to the chart. More specifically, look at the I proposition under the assumption that it's false, and notice that the arrow leading upwards yields a false superaltern. The same goes with the O proposition. When the O is false, the E is false. Take a look at the examples for each before moving on. Now let's take a look at contradictories. Remember that contradictories are propositions that cannot be true at the same time and they cannot be false at the same time. So we don't even need to know the truth value of the premise because the immediate inference, the contradictory, will always have the opposite truth value. 
So we talked about contradictories in the following way. We said that any statement and its negation cannot be true at the same time. If I utter the sentence, I own an iPhone, and I also utter the sentence, I do not own an iPhone, we would say that I am being self-contradictory or I am asserting self-contradictory statements if I try and claim that it's true that I own and I do not own an iPhone. You would basically say to me, look, Mia, pick one or the other, it can't be both. So if an A claim is true, the O must be false and vice versa. And if an E claim is true, the I must be false and vice versa. Before moving on, go ahead and pause the video so that you can take a look at the examples. Now, I do want to point out uh, before we move on that the examples that I give you are meant to pump your intuitions about the uh, correctness or illegitimacy of certain inferences. But what we want to bear in mind and what will be helpful to us um, as we move forward to understanding this uh, notion is that the logical structure, not the content, is what makes an inference legitimate or illegitimate. So when I say when we move on, I'm thinking of the Venn diagrams that will offer us a visual representation of the logical structure of each of these proposition types. Now let's move on to contraries. Universals are contraries. Take a look at the top blue bar. It's a bar rather than arrows because contradictory or sorry, contraries um, do not have a reciprocal relationship with each other. Here's what I mean. Contraries can't both be true, but they can both be false. So in order for us to draw an inference from a universal to its contrary, we need to know that that universal is true. So take a look at the A proposition and the second arrow that goes from A to E, or sorry, the second line, which is an arrow that goes from A to E. So the first arrow goes from A to E, and that is an arrow that tells us if the A proposition is true, the E must be false. Now look at the third line or the second arrow. If the E proposition is true, the A must be false. If, like I said before, the E proposition or the A proposition is false, in other words, um, we start with a false universal, the contrary may be true, may be false, we just don't know. That's another way of saying what I had mentioned before when I said both universals can be false at the same time. That means then that when we start with a false universal, our inference is undetermined. Go ahead and take a look at each of the examples before we move on. The correlate to contraries is this pair of inf inferences known as subcontraries. So take your eyes down to your particular claims, I and O. You'll notice that on the very bottom, you have a bar that, like the uh, bar um, in the A and E proposition references, is um, a blank. In other words, there's no directional arrow. And that tells you that I and O and O and I inferences, that is subcontraries, do not bear a reciprocal relationship to each other just as contraries don't bear a reciprocal relationship to each other. You have to know the truth value of the premise, and even then, knowing the truth value of the premise might not or will not always give you the immediate inference or a necessary immediate inference. So, subcontraries can't both be false, but both can be true. So if an I proposition is false, so look at the top uh, bar, the first arrow, if the I proposition is false, the O must be true 
If the O proposition is false, the I must be true. The O to I inference is your second uh, arrow and the second bar, if you will, in the series. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. We know that some phones, I'm sorry, some iPhones are Androids is false. The subcontrary, some iPhones are not Androids, is true. Some guitars are not stringed instruments is false. Some guitars are stringed instruments is true. So you must know first that your particular proposition is false in order to draw the necessary inference that its subcontrary is true. On the other hand, it may be the case that your uh, two particular claims, your subcontraries, are both true at the same time. So because if you start with a true particular, you may end up with a true or a false subcontrary, the inference from a true particular to its subcontrary is undetermined. Take a look at the examples. You'll notice that when you start with a true I, you sometimes get a true O, you sometimes get a false O. The same with starting with a true O. You sometimes get a true I, you sometimes get a false I. Because the inference is undetermined, we don't allow that inference as a necessary inference. What we've been looking at is the square of opposition from the traditional standpoint. And remember what that means. That means that we assume a member of the subject class in our two universal claims exists. So what we're going to want to do is distinguish between what's known as existential import, which is what reflects the traditional interpretation of the universal claim, from not assuming existential import, which is what reflects the modern interpretation of the universal claim. And when we understand the traditional Venn diagram, we understand in a new way or another way or a way that illuminates for us the inferences we are and are not allowed to make on the square of opposition. We'll also see why on the modern interpretation of the square of opposition, there is just one set of inferences allowed, contradictories, A and O, and E and I. Okay, so let me show you what you're looking at. If you uh, take a look at the uh, two circles, remember that we said when we're diagramming our propositions, rather than nesting circles or um, coming up with a different type of diagram for each uh, uh, proposition type, if we have two overlapping circles or two circles with an area of overlap, then that becomes our template for any of the four proposition types. These are called Venn diagrams. Now, the shading that you see, or in this specific case, the red lines, uh, is going to represent emptiness. It's another way of saying that whatever S's there may be, they're all dumped into that area of overlap between the S and the P class. So on the traditional interpretation, when we say all S are P, we're saying that there's not even one S that is in the area of S outside of P. And by the way, the red circle, uh, sorry, the red uh, X that circled tells us that in fact, we assume there is an S. So think about it this way. When we say all dogs are animals, we assume there exists at least one member of the dog class. But now drop your eye down to the modern interpretation. The modern interpretation suspends judgment about existential import. 
And this helps us an awful lot when we think about propositions where we are pretty confident that the subject class is empty. All leprechauns are gold hoarders. All werewolves are frightening creatures. All vampires are blood-sucking uh, uh, undead. Those uh, subject classes, leprechauns, werewolves, and vampires, don't have any members. So the modern interpretation says, look, whether we are talking about dogs, cats, tables, chairs, vampires, werewolves, leprechauns, fairies, whatever, we're not going to assume a member of the subject class. That is going to um, just complicate our inferences. In other words, the modern interpretation uh, says that by not assuming existential import, we free ourselves completely from ever needing to know about the truth value of the proposition in question. Now let's take a look at the Venn diagrams for E propositions. The traditional interpretation, again, assumes a member of the subject class. And just as an aside, um, technically both the S and the P class uh, uh, assume membership, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but you can see that in both the traditional and the modern interpretation, the area of overlap is shaded. What that means is that the area of overlap between S and P is empty. There's nothing there. There can't be anything there. The traditional interpretation says no SRP, and by the way, we're assuming a member of the S class. The modern, modern interpretation says no SRP, and we don't assume a member of the S class exists. Now, the Venn diagrams for I and O propositions are the same in both the modern and traditional interpretations because the modern and traditional interpretations are of the universal propositions alone. The interpretations do not impact at all the particular or existential claims, some S are P, some S are not P. Your I proposition has an X in the area of overlap which denotes that there is an S and it's also a P. That's why it's in the area of overlap. The X outside the S class in the O proposition says there is an S and it is outside the P class. Another way you might consider this when you're thinking about the concept of distribution is that the P class rejects or uh, um, uh, precludes any S from um, uh, participating in it or from being uh, a part of it. So there is at least one S that is completely outside of P. Now let's look at the traditional square of opposition and our Venns. First, look at your two left side uh, propositions. You've got your universal affirmative in the upper left corner and your particular affirmative in the bottom left corner. Notice that the A proposition includes the S, pro or sorry, includes the I proposition. All SRP assumes a member of the S class. Hence, if all SRP is true, some SRP is also true. Notice that the same is the case with the E and the O propositions. Those are in your respectively upper right and lower right columns. Remember, A is in the upper left, I is in the lower left, E is in the upper right, O is in the lower right. No SRP includes a member of the subject class, which makes some S are not P true. Now let's take a look at your contradictories, because I think that the Venn diagrams are really going to help you understand how it is that contradictories um, look, or what it is, what the logical structure of the propositions are, such that if an A is true, the O must be false. So notice that in an A proposition, the S area outside of P is empty. Emptiness means there's nothing there. So if there's nothing there, you couldn't possibly have an X in the S area. Now take a look at the universal negative, the E claim. The E claim 
asserts that the area of overlap between S and P is empty. And if that's the case, there can't be an X in the area of overlap. Notice also that if, now look at the O claim again, if the O claim is true, if there is one member of the S class that's outside of P, that means there's a member of the S class in the area that is outside of the P class. If that's true, then the A claim diagonally to your uh, left, upper left, can't be true. And the same also with your I and your E. So the diagrams help us understand how it is that contradictories work. Take a few minutes to think about, by way of your diagrams, how contraries, subcontraries, subalternation, and superalternation work or don't work based on our previous discussion of truth values. The modern square of opposition and Venn's makes, I think, much clearer uh, why it is that only contradictories are allowed when we don't assume a member of the subject class exists. Once again, take a look at these diagrams in connection with our previous discussion about contradictories. Notice that the A and the O say opposite things visually, and the E and the I say opposite things visually. Remember, these diagrams are visual representations of the logical structure of each of our four claim types. Now let's review obversion, conversion, and contraposition. Remember we said that the square of opposition on both the traditional and the modern interpretation is about making inferences between proposition types, between A and E, for example, or uh, O and A. Obversion, conversion, and contraposition, on the other hand, are inferences that involve manipulating the proposition itself, not moving from one proposition to another. In other words, what we do with obversion, conversion, and contraposition is we take a particular, or, sorry, we take a specific claim type, not a particular claim. A particular claim is an O or an I claim. Uh, so to be more exacting, uh, with obversion, conversion, and contraposition, we take a specific claim type and we manipulate its internal structure to see if the result is equivalent to the original. That's a really important point to remember. We're looking for equivalences. And I think you'll see these equivalences clearly by uh, the Venn diagrams that we look at in a little bit. So first off, obversion. Obversion is the most robust immediate inference um, involving manipulation of a proposition's internal structure. It's the most robust because it's valid for all four claim types on both the traditional and modern interpretations. So here's what we do. We take a proposition and we change its quality. Remember, Quantity is the how much, universal or particular. Quality is the mode or the in what way, which means affirmative or negative. So we leave the quantity alone, we change the quality, and we add the complement or a complement to the predicate. Now, the complement of a claim, remember, is everything outside of that class. And linguistically, that's designated with the expression non. So we get the following. The universal affirmative, all S or P, becomes no S or non P. No S or P becomes all S or non P. Some S or P becomes some S or not non P. And some S or not P becomes some S or non P. What you might consider doing is taking sentences that make sense to you, 
Um, so for example, you know, all dogs are animals, right? And uh, obverting each sentence so that you can have a more tangible understanding of the, how the logical structure is, of the um, obverted claim is equivalent to the original. Conversion is valid for E and I propositions on both interpretations. So it's got a restricted um, uh, um, scope. In addition, conversion is valid by limitation for A propositions, but only on the traditional interpretation. In addition, conversion is never valid for O propositions. I think that you will uh, more clearly recognize how conversion is or is not legitimate or is legitimate in a restricted way when you look at uh, the converted claims, but also when you look at the Venn diagrams. So uh, first off, conversion involves swapping or switching or changing the subject and predicate position. You'll see that for uh, conversion by limitation, which works only on the A proposition, we first subalternate. Uh, in other words, we first move to the subaltern, which is an I claim, and then we convert the I claim. So let's look at our um, uh, converted propositions. First, the A proposition becomes all P or S. If you think of a couple of examples that are tangible, you should recognize why this proposition, or sorry, why this inference is not legitimate. If I say all dogs are animals, and then I infer from that that all animals are dogs, we come up with a false proposition. On the other hand, if we say first that all dogs are animals, therefore some dogs are animals, therefore some animals are dogs, we're in good shape. That's conversion by limitation. Now let's look at the E proposition and its, and its conversion. So no SRP becomes no PRS. If it's true that no rabbits are donkeys, it's also true that no donkeys are rabbits. Some SRP becomes some PRS. If it's true that some animals are dogs, it's also true that some dogs are animals. The O proposition, though, is never going to yield a valid conversion. Some S are not P is converted to some P are not S, but the inference is not valid. That's because some P R not S is not equivalent to some S or not P. If I say that some smartphones are not androids, I am not saying the same things when I say some androids are not smartphones. Lastly, let's look at contraposition. Contraposition <clears throat> does for A and O propositions what conversion does for E and I. Conversion, or sorry, contraposition is valid for A and O propositions on both interpretations, valid by limitation for E propositions on the traditional interpretation only, just as, remember, conversion was valid on both interpretations for E and I, but valid by limitation on the traditional interpretation only for A. Similarly, contraposition is never valid for I propositions, and remember, conversion is never valid for O propositions. So we have mirror immediate inferences. There are two steps involved in contraposition for A and O propositions and for I propositions and three steps for contraposition by limitation for E propositions. And actually, to be more exacting, I should say, there are two steps to contrapose 
A, E, I, and O propositions. And there are three steps to validly contrapose the E proposition. So what do we do? Well, we change the subject and predicate terms just like we do in conversion, but we have an additional step, which is to add the complement to each of the subject and predicate terms. So all S are P becomes all non P are non S no S or P becomes no non P or non S, some S or P becomes some non P or non S, and lastly, some S or not P becomes some non P or not non S. Now, if you're feeling a little bit dizzy because of all of the nons and the nos flying around, don't be surprised, it's normal. Um, these are not super intuitive for us. I think, again, looking at tangible examples will help you. In addition, when we look at the Venn diagrams, I think you'll have a visual, uh, I think having a visual representation of these logical structures will help you see their equivalences and why, when they're not equivalents, when they're not equivalent, they're not equivalent. Uh, before we move on, um, let's do what we did uh, in conversion for the A proposition. Let's do that for the E proposition here in contraposition. When we say no S or P, if we drop down to some S or not P, and then we contrapose the claim, we've got a legitimate inference. We've got an equivalent inference or an equivalent statement, an equivalent proposition. That's because, as we've seen already, contraposition for O propositions yields an equivalent proposition to the original. Remember, I noted uh, that conversion and contraposition are mirror inferences. Conversion is valid on both interpretations for E and I. Contraposition is valid on both interpretations for A and O. Conversion is never valid for uh, O propositions. Contraposition is never valid for I propositions. Conversion is valid by limitation on the traditional interpretation only for A propositions. Contraposition is valid by limitation only on the traditional interpretation for E propositions. Oh boy, that's a lot to think about. Let's look at this literally um, by way of Venn diagrams. So obversion, as you can see, is valid for all four claim types. Why is it valid for all four claim types? Well, notice that the obverted claim is visually the same as the original. Pause for a moment and look at each diagram. Notice that conversion on the traditional interpretation uh, forces us to restrict the A proposition or to limit the A proposition to an I. So we first make the move from A to I, then we see that the conversion uh, is equivalent to the original I proposition. But if we just convert the A proposition, we can see that the two diagrams are not equivalent you'll see that the, the E and the I propositions are respectively equivalent to their originals. Notice that for the E proposition, I mentioned this earlier, um, but we assume existential import technically for both the subject and predicate classes because they're reciprocally distributed. Lastly, take a look at the O proposition. They're, they don't match up right? And there's no way to get them to match up. So the inference is not legitimate. So before we move on, um, think about this a little bit. Let me go back to obversion. When you have a diagram that's equivalent to the original, so here it is also for conversion, you have a valid inference. That's because these propositions logically say the same thing. Lastly, Let's look at contraposition. We can see that the A proposition, when contraposed, 
is identical to the original. The same is also the case with the O proposition. But take a look at, respectively, E and I. They're hard to sort of wrap your head around in terms of saying no non-P or non-S or some non-P or non-S. Um, and, and that's because these just aren't intuitive. But take a look at the diagrams and see if those help you to work through what the uh, written sent statement asserts. Now let's look at the modern interpretation of, respectively, conversion, obversion, contraposition. I'm starting with conversion because um, it's arguably the most intuitive of the immediate inferences. And you can see that the modern interpretation restricts equivalences to E and I. So there's no stepping down from A to I because, as you can see, there's no assumption that the subject class has at least one member. By the way, um, I recognize that the um, diagrams that I've borrowed uh, uh, show A and B for the respective subject and predicate classes. But recall, we talked about this together, that it, the, the S and the P are, are the standard um, uh, representative letters for a subject class and a predicate class and a categorical claim. But capital letters A and B uh, suffice just as well. So that's why you're getting those here. Take a look at obversion on the modern interpretation. Remember, we said that obversion is valid for all four claim types on both the modern and traditional interpretations, and you can see that here. Pause for a moment and look at each of the sentences and the diagrams so that you can understand how the diagrams look the same based on the logical structure of each of these proposition types. And lastly, contraposition on the modern interpretation is valid for A and O, but never for E and I. So we've accomplished a lot here. I hope that uh, given the other discussions that we've had about categorical propositions, and the practice that uh, we've done in from the textbook and that we've done um, in addition to what's in the textbook, both uh, in terms of videos as well as what's on uh, Quizlet, is helpful to you as you're making your way through this material. Now, it feels like a lot, but if you think about it in, in chunks, right, um, it might make more sense. So think about it this way. We can make immediate inferences uh, between proposition types. We can also make immediate inferences by manipulating the internal structure of a given proposition type. In addition, we can interpret the universal from the standpoint of assuming that a member of the subject class exists and not assuming that a member of the subject class exists. When we assume a member of the subject class exists, we call that, uh, we, we say that the proposition assumes existential import. Now, uh, when we're dealing with uh, existential import propositions, we uh, can make certain inferences uh, in an unrestricted way, but then there are other inferences that are restricted. Not assuming existential import, which is what we do in the modern square of opposition, eliminates those restricted inferences. We just don't deal with those. The modern interpretation uh, effectively wants us to make all and only unrestricted inferences. What do I mean by restricted inferences? Well, I mean those inferences that force us to know something about the truth value of our premise in order to draw an immediate inference. I hope this has been helpful. As usual, let me know if you have any questions.